Okay. Okay. All right. What what I want to do is explain why we're even talking about this topic uh, by looking at economics to begin with, because this should be obvious. The stuff we're talking about shouldn't be the sort of thing we need to explain to people. It's just like explaining that no, it isn't actually sunrise. It's earth rotate. We use sunrise because that's what we thought for one and a half thousand years. And nobody's come up for a nice expression for earth rotate to explain why the sun appears to rise in the sky. But why are we even having to talk about this is because economists don't understand it. And it used to be a, in a sense, a, not, I wouldn't say it's a deliberate uh, attempt not to understand, just they had a model and they weren't about to change it. So this is my not my first exposure by any means, but one time I found myself on the firing line from Paul Krugman uh, <laughs> talking about banks and so on. I won't bother about the side about me here. But this is the part that I really like here. Um, if you get rid of the keystone there, please, because you're covering the... <laughs> okay. Notice he says, in particular, he asserts that putting banks into the story is essential, the story being macroeconomics. Now, I'm all for including the banking sector in stories where it's relevant, but why is it so crucial to a story about debt and leverage? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> laughing, laughing material. Now, he, 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 he ended up losing the argument, walking away claiming he won it, which was good fun. Uh, but later on, he comes up this is notice creators of money, inverted commas around it, and attacking anybody who says that banks actually create money. And then out comes the Bank of England paper in 2014 that's saying that banks create money. And his answer there is, say, colour me puzzled. I've seen a number of people touting why this is so important. Uh, and he said, well, it's not really important. It doesn't change anything. And this, is, this is the sort of thing that I find economists do. But my favourite instance of that just came out recently because I was almost certain a paper like this would turn up. And this says, loanable funds versus money creation and banking, a benchmark result. Okay. Because they find that they can no longer deny that banks create money or ignore it because when minority economists like Basil Moore, who's just died just recently, he began the whole tradition of analysing the creation of money by banks in post-Keynesian economics about 40 years ago. Uh, when Basil said it, they can ignore Basil. When I said it, they actively ignore me. Uh, the loan to the more positive money as well. When the Bank of England and the Bundesbank come out and say it, it's a bit harder to ignore. I said, no, I've got to say, well, yes, okay, banks create money, but does it matter? Well, no. And this, this is just priceless uh, in, in, the, in the classic sense of the word. Hang on, pardon me. This page moving around a bit too much. Let's, okay, let's do it this way. Okay. We established a benchmark result for the relationship between loanable funds, which is the model they have where banks just are intermediaries. So I call it the Ashley Madison theory of banking. <laughs> and introduce you to somebody else who wants to do something to you, you might enjoy, and charges you a fee for it. Doesn't actually do it to you directly. Uh, we establish a bank match between that and money creation. We show that both processes use the same allocations. Look at this: where there is no uncertainty and thus no bank default. Okay. Uh, in such cases, using the much simpler loanable funds approach as a shortcut does not imply any loss of generality. Now, it's then followed by about 60 pages of mathematics. What, I call this what they do in mathematics, not mathematics. Okay? It has symbols in it. It looks like it's sensible, etc., etc. Uh, intimidating enough people who don't have enough mathematics to know it's pretty simple stuff. Um, but on they go, this huge paper, uh, finally concluding that so long as you're willing to assume no risk and therefore no uncertainty, there's no difference between the two models. What planet are they on? Honestly, this is just the sort of nonsense they do. So here's my benchmark result, and this is slightly more complicated to look at initially. But what it is, is a, a software package I've designed called Minsky, which is used to design develop models of monetary flows using double entry bookkeeping. So that looks pretty intimidating, but I think this might look a bit simpler to you. And this is just what's actually behind each of those bank symbols there. I'll move it over so this is slightly more visible. And given the screen resolution here, let's go for a bit of a larger display. So what I have is the model that they have in their heads that banks are just intermediaries who introduce a saver to a borrower and then they charge a fee to make money out of it. And this is actually aping a model written by Krugman and Eggertson in uh, 2012 but putting it in genuine dynamic form rather than what they call dynamic stochastic 
general equilibrium models, which need the dynamic more general, in my opinion. Uh, so I, they, they have a consumer sector lending to an investment sector. So that's what I've got here. The consumer sector has a bank account at the at the banking system. That they take money out of their account, lend it to the investment sector. The investment sector over time will repay that amount of money, and then the investment sector pays interest to the consumer sector for doing the loan, and the consumer sector pays a fee to the bank for introducing the say the, the borrower to them. That's the basic model they have. And the remainder is wages being paid, consumption, uh, investment, etc., etc. So I hope that's fairly easy to see just in terms of the table layout. That's why I've designed this particular software package. Now, what I can do is simulate this over time. And you notice the growth rate here is zero, pretty much zero. GDP is flatlining. There's an increasing amount of debt over time, given the, the dynamics of borrowing and repaying that I've got. Uh, rising level of debt, as you can see too, the debt to GDP ratio is rising. Nothing much happening on GDP. Now I can change the parameters of the model while it runs and increase the rate of lending and, and reduce repayment, which means the debt grows even faster. But having done that, there's only a transitory impact upon the growth rate. In fact, it reduces the growth rate. You can see the debt ratio is rising quite dramatically. Um, but in terms of GDP, yeah, who cares? Nothing much has happened. And I can go in reverse and I can dramatically slow down lending and I can speed up how fast repayment is done. And now we've got a plunging debt ratio. And yeah, something's happened to GDP, it's a slight increase in GDP levels for a while, but it falls back to the same level. So on that basic, no big deal. You know, you can ignore the banking sector. And that's what they've got in their mind, even when you put this in a genuine dynamic framework rather than the crap that they, they do, which is a series of static time shots they call dynamics. Uh, even you put it in a genuinely dynamic framework, if they were right about what banks did, they'd be right to ignore them. Okay. Now, I can very rapidly say, well, let's go to the real world here by what, what's actually happening in this table. As you can see, hang on, let's bring it there. Ah. Okay, what I have here is the banking sector's view, but I can also see it from the consumer sector's view of the economy. I have to, let's see, let's actually go this way, let's see. Okay, where's the consumer sector's view there? Okay, so this is how the, oh sorry, this is still the banking view. Ah, we don't, this is a, this is a uh, open source software package. We don't have the world's best control over some elements of the interface there. So let's see, that the con yeah, that's the consumer sector's view. Now, that's no, still the banking sector's bloody hell. Pardon me, I'm making a bit of a fist of my demonstration. Let's get these out. There it is, there's the consumer sector. Okay, so this is the consumer sector's view of the economy. I'll make that larger. And what you have is the consumer sector has a deposit account at the bank, which we've already seen. Now, the debt didn't turn up in the banking view because debt in this model is not an asset of the banking sector. It's an asset of the consumer sector. That's crap. Okay? We know that the real world says banks create money, bank, bank debt, there, are, there is some peer-to-peer -peer lending. Okay? Yes, there is a tiny amount of this, but the vast majority of lending is banks creating money and creating deposits at the same time. So what I can do with Minsky is say, well, let's stop pretending that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. So I can delete that column. And I can then go across to the financial transactions that are they pretend are happening between the consumer sector and the investment sector, between the less saver and the borrower. Get rid of that. Now once I've done it, I can now come back to the banker's view and say, well, that's actually an asset of the banking sector. So I insert an extra column. Because every asset is somebody else's liability, and I've deleted the asset of the debt, but the liability is still shown there, and there's a liability of the investment sector, I can click this down arrow and it remembers what's available as an unallocated liability for an asset. Bang, I put that up in the, in the uh, now being shown as an asset of the banking sector. I have to simply have to say that the interest payments are actually made to the banking sector, and forget about the bank fee. Yes, my banks make money out of bank fees, but that's second order to being able to charge interest on loans. So I've done that. There are a few more changes I need to make to make it fully consistent, but that'll do. And now if I simulate the model again, just with those changes, several things happen. First of all, the growth rate is positive. Notice that? I'm then gonna go back to the initial conditions I had for the rate of lending, which is here. 
and rate of repayment, which is there. Notice the rising level of debt, which is the black line here, is causing a rising level of money. Okay, Debt creates money. Uh, and if I then have a increase in how fast banks lend, so that's a decrease, wrong way, let's go this way. It's always fun turning a computer in the dark. Um, slow down repayment, the growth rate accelerates, GDP is going up. Now if you have a slowdown in how fast banks create money, and an increase in how fast people repay it, gee whiz, you can have a financial crisis. Now that's the gap between the mythical model they have and the real world. And it's so simple to illustrate it just by saying, debt's an asset of the banks, guys. Okay? So that's the sort of stuff they're ignoring. Now what that means is they have ignored this process. And here I might actually, let's just move this chart down a bit. This one here just illustrates what Maggie Thatcher's Big Bang actually did. And it's more the deregulation of bank lending for mortgages that really set it off. From 1880, this is where the chart starts, from 1880 until 1980, the level of private debt never exceeded 73% of GDP. As it happened, the booms and busts, you can see a decline here, which is back at the uh, during the Second World War. That's the decline during the during, so First World War. That's the Second World War decline level. Thatcher comes into power. You get the, let's liberate the, you know, animal spirits of the capitalist sector, was actually liberating the predatory uh, instincts of the financial sector on the rest of the economy, and private debt went from 55% of GDP to 195%. And then the decline that occurred here is what caused the crisis that the Conservatives have very successfully blamed on the Labor Party, which I find hilarious, uh, because that would imply that the Labor Party's economic policies caused the crisis in America, which is a bit hard, you know, I mean, if you go to a Tory party and you consume what interesting drugs they must consume to believe that, then maybe I could come out with that line. But it's all been caused by a debt bubble breaking down. Okay, That's the real story. So we've got ourselves in a situation, courtesy of the mainstream, which knows as much about money as Ptolemaic astronomers knew about the structure of the universe. And it's time we got rid of them. Thank you. So, how many have we got now? Mm. I would say um, it might be best to go into audience questions first. Yeah, sure. Because I'm sure you may have a lot of questions about all of that very insightful and quite complicated <laughs> um, economic stuff going on there. Um, so, Nina? So, this, this big bang happened globally now? Is it happening in America at the same time? There's same uh, it, well, you, you, what you had was a change in the power of the financial sector and a change in its behaviour over time. So uh, back after the, in the Great Depression, a lot of people, a lot of the bankers who led the speculative bubble of the 1920s, we now call the Roaring Twenties, a lot of them ended up serving at, uh, in, in American prisons. And there were bank closures under Roosevelt. Uh, there was a dramatic reining in of the power of the banking sector. And so you, when you began the Second World War, and you can see it in the stats here, America began the post-war period here with a low level of debt than it's had all, all, virtually the last hundred years of private debt. Now, at that stage, bankers were incredibly conservative. You went for a bank loan, you had to wear a suit, go to the bank manager and prove you had a deposit, etc., etc. Then as the level of debt rise, rose, rose over time, you get a, a change in the ideology uh, that bankers become, rather than sort of responsible, restricted credit, they're, would you like a credit card with that when you go to get money out of the bank? And that whole philosophical shift occurred as well. So the fact that Thatcher fell for that in 82 was like a common trend coming through, but it was something which is driven by the increasing power that increasing levels of debt give the financial sector over the real economy. You can also, I think, look at it from the perspective of, of political economy and, and crisis theory, whereby there is a broad um, crisis that starts taking place in kind of Western capitalism during the 1970s. And from a kind of traditional, uh, almost like a Marxist perspective, that results from a kind of squeeze in the profits of corporations. So the profitability goes down. Um, and that's partly as a result of kind of competition from lots of different other sources. It's partly a result of the kind of very Keynesian policies that were pursued by governments 
Um, and this is kind of Kalecki's argument, which is that uh, Keynesian economics is a cul-de-sac because um, by implementing those kinds of policies that empower labour, you increase their power relative to capital, which leads to capital profits, which creates a crisis. Um, and so a lot of um, uh, kind of the analysis, the political economic analysis of financial capitalism traces these issues back to the 1970s when you have this standoff, which is ultimately won by financial capital, which, which resolves the crisis of capitalism by extending debt to labour, um, which allows, which kind of gets over this issue about uh, labour as being, not being able to buy the goods that are produced by um, capitalists because they, don't, they aren't paid enough. And it, it gets over this, this um, uh, issue about new gains from growth. Um, and you start seeing the kind of decoupling of, of wages and productivity, um, which is papered over by the provision of more debt. So, yeah. Well, I think what you're asking was was a big bang just so much happened in the UK. Um, <laughs> it's a global thing. Yeah. But, but yeah. The big bang we referred to was a series of policies by the government between 1983 and 1986, deregulating finance, and the same kind of policies happened globally. Um, so in the US, I think a lot of them happened under Bill Clinton. Um, <coughs> and politicians to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. So, at the front. Um, yeah, on, on Monday when I woke up, I heard um, Vince Cable on the radio talk to John Humphreys. And mm. John Humphreys says, to you, well, the debt has to be paid off. Someone has to pay it off. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, And the, I was interested in that because uh, your USA one, because I, I know that 1835, President Jackson paid off the USA debt, and then the economy went tits up. So could, I, I'm not going to understand it, but could you explain to me why the debt's a good thing? The well, the government debt, uh, if you owned your own bank, would you be worried about being in debt to your own bank? No. Okay, that's pretty much why the government can get away with it, because uh, the government, uh, even though they've made it incredibly complicated to do it, the central bank effectively is the underwriter of any government debt. And it's an underwriter which is required to uh, back, backstop the bonds so they're all sold and buys them off private bank, private banks and private financial institutions what they call open market operations all the time. Um, so you, and everybody, nobody re rejects a check, even even the worst libertarian isn't going to say this isn't money if, if a thousand dollars from the government turns up in their bank account. So in that sense there's a flexibility to the money supply that the central bankers, to some, some of them, began to really understand that back in the early post-war period in America. And it's again economic theory that says no that can't happen but in fact it has happened and the data just supports it what you're seeing there the chart i'm showing you there is the united states government surplus since 1900 now that dotted line there is zero okay anything above that is a surplus anything below it is a deficit despite all the rhetoric about government having to pay back the debt and you know it's absolutely the crucial thing that it happens yada 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 for the last century, the average level of the government uh, surplus has been minus 2.2% of GDP. You take out the wars, it falls by about 0.1 or 2%. So even without the wars, which are huge, as you can see the scale of the deficit in the First World War and the Second World War, take those out, you've still got an average deficit of about 2% of GDP. Now call me crazy, but I reckon 120 years is roughly the long run. Okay. So 120 years worth, despite all the rhetoric in America, despite all the art, you've got to pay the debt back at some stage. The debt's been, in that sense, the, the dif difference between government spending and government taxation has been about spending has been about 2% larger than taxation for the last 120 years. Now, America's not exactly in great shape right now, but I don't think you'd call it a, a weak country. Okay? 120 years, and you'll find similar data for the UK when you look back. So this, the normal situation is governments spend more than they get back in taxes and they can finance it. And we, the rest of us can't do it. And partly why this matters as well is when you look at the aggregate of all financial transactions, if I, had, if I gave you $100 and you recorded what happened to your bank account, I recorded to mine, the sum would be zero. Okay, that's, that's the bottom line when you look at the aggregate level of monetary. If you add up all financial trade flows, you get zero. Now, if, we all, if we're all trying to save more money than we have now, that means we're trying to spend less than we earn. But if we spend less than we earn, somebody else is forced to spend more than they earn, because then the aggregate expenditure is identical to income. 
Okay? Your, if I spend money buying you know, your book off you, um, then that's my expenditure, that's your income. Two sides of the same coin. Now, in the aggregate, all those things are going to be zero. So if you want to save money, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to get spend more less money out than you get back in, somewhere else, someone in the system has to be doing the exact opposite. Now, who can do it? We can't do it because we run out of money. Individuals can't. Firms and households can't do it. If banks do it, which they can do indefinitely, that's whacking debt on your account at the same time. So yes, they're giving you money because they're lending you more money than you get back in repayments. But that means your net change in assets is zero. Okay. You're trying to get more equity yourself. The only way it can happen is that the government spends more than it gets back in taxation. And it's the only institution that can do that. So if you imagine the rest of the economy, basically households and firms, are all trying to accumulate positive equity, they can't do it okay, unless somebody else is accumulating negative. Now, the one institution that can do that indefinitely because we accept their liabilities as money is the government. So this whole emphasis by people like Vince Cable is just based, again, on a Ptolemaic vision of the economy. And I don't really blame Vince Cable for it because it's mainstream economics that taught them all that crap at university. Just feeling the mood of the room. Do we want to go and get a drink, have a break, or want to continue? Mm. And one more question here. Um, I'm just going to ask you whether you distinguish between capital credit and consumer credit. In terms of capital, in your analysis, credit, credit for capital, credit to acquire credit. capital goods. I mean, I, I quote from the the U.S. economy. America's three thousand largest companies um, are in perpetual debt, and you, right. show, you show me a profitable company, I'll show a company that's profitably using capital debt, not consumer debt. Exactly. And this is one of the... That's an activity that's yeah. the government. When, when, when you think about... The, the, one of the things which I've learned in the last 10 years, both... Well, I knew a lot of it um, before from my modelling of financial instability, but in building the Minsky software, which lets me do that monetary modelling very directly, uh, I've learned a lot about the importance of accounting as like an underlay to understand financial transactions. And one of the... What they call the fundamental law of accounting is assets minus liabilities equals equity. So for every individual who has assets minus liabilities minus equity, you get zero. And that's what you'll see in these tables here. That's the check we're doing over here to make sure the rows are correct. So I didn't actually correct that little there. I've got to say the equity of the bank there is 15. Now that becomes zero. Well, in the aggregate, if, if assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero for everybody, and think about banks. Banks, <coughs> banks as institutions must have positive equity. Yeah, a bank whose, as, whose liabilities are greater than its assets is bankrupt. Okay. In the aggregate, equity is zero. This is talking about financial, not talking about the goods and services we're all sitting on, but the financial system, the aggregate of all equity is zero. If banks are running positive equity, and they have to be positive equity to be banks, then that means the rest of the non-bank sector is negative equity. Okay. Now, when you think about households in negative equity, that's a problem. But firms in negative equity, as you're pointing out here, firms in negative equity make money because they turn over the cash they do have and make a cash flow that can service their interest payments. So the role, the, the fact that, bank, that predominantly what should happen in a healthy capitalist economy is the firm sector should be in negative equity in the aggregate because it's borrowed that money to invest in for working capital. Now, instead we're caught up in this crazy... The, the only reason we have positive equity overall in the non-government sector is because the government has negative equity in that sense. It's spending more than it gets back. It can do it. So it's realising all these various elements is like understanding gravitation to reinterpret why it is that we call what sunrise, we call sunrise what actually happens, which is Earth rotate. Um, that's a long-winded answer, but yes, you, I do take that account and the problem about what's happened in the, the post-80s period, and you can see this in the data, is that the banking sector pretty much saturated uh, the amount of debt that uh, the corporate sector would take on by about 1990. And since that time, they've been looking for somebody else to push debt to, and they pushed it into the housing sector, households. And of course, households are predominantly borrowed to buy mortgages, or mortgages to buy houses, and that's what's driven up house prices. So it's been a totally unproductive use of that money creation capability. So, you, so your asset minus liabilities equals equity. That's a balance sheet. Yeah, yeah. But that is repaid in the profit and loss statement. 
Yeah, yeah. That, and that, that comes up as well, but normally you're taking out, when you look at the renewal of loans versus the repayment of loans, um, for, this, for the banking, for the corporate sector, now that's sort of fluctuating around zero, up and down during booms and slumps. But the household sector went from, like in the UK's case, went from about 30% of GDP as the household debt level in 1980 to 100%. Okay. Now it's also fluctuating around zero, heading down, and that's why we're in a slump. So, so I want to say that um, consumer debt is terrible because it enables people to buy what they cannot afford, which is a symptom of inadequate earning capacity. Um, yeah, there's a certain amount to which consumer debt matters for things like buying a car or buying a house. You pay but, interest on top of the cost. Pardon? If you had, in, if you had in, enough income, you wouldn't be, no one would have consumer debt if they had sufficient income. Yeah, I mean that's. There's, there is a problem as well around. Uh, so, it's not just a case so, that corporate debt is is good and so that. Just, so corporate debt's better than. I would agree with. Corporate debt expands ownership. Yeah. Corporate better better than corporate debt that concentrates. I, I would say it's house it's, it's 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 household debt that expands household asset prices by a positive feedback loop between leverage and house prices. That's the bad one. There's but, also, I mean, because of. What we've seen because of the financialization of non financial corporations, you're not just getting companies borrowing in order to invest. Uh, since the 1980s, since you know, you've had all the debt leverage buyouts of the 80s, you've been seeing um, companies basically completely losing all of their in terms of their cash and um, borrowing in order to fund uh, dividend payouts, in order to boost their share prices, to fund share buybacks, all these sorts of things that. Um, are not just bad for investment and therefore for economic growth, but also have a really severe impact on, on financial instability. Um, so yeah, that kind of debt is also pretty bad, I would argue. Yeah. So does anyone, we'll take one final question, and I think we'll go to the bar, and we can discuss mm. it there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. One more question now. <laughs> one, one more question. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, going back. Uh, yeah, I'm just going back to the Minsky model. I was going to give you an opportunity to explain a bit more the mechanism by which, when you put um, debt as an asset for the banks, how that actually interacts with the economy. Because it appears in my head just to be a renaming. No, it's not renaming because when you've got the vision that the, main, the mainstream has of lending is one non bank lends to another non bank. Now, if you, you're lending out of bank accounts, that means one bank account goes down, the other goes up. There's no creation of money. Okay, just recently changing who the bank owes the liability to, and therefore has the money in their account, but it doesn't change the aggregate amount of money. But if I put the loan as an asset of the banking sector, then what happens is the assets of the banking sector rise, and so do the liabilities, and the liability is new money. That's the fundamental reason why it matters. And then, with it, so also, it's worth elaborating a bit more. The reason, what, what, what the mainstream thinks is, the banks lend out of reserves, and you notice absolutely nothing is happening in my reserves column here. Okay, reserves are irrelevant for lending. What actually helps them drive lending is the amount of equity they have. And fundamentally, what a bank will do is start with a certain amount of capital, which you know, they, this is where we get capital and reserves confused. They start with a certain amount of money they raise, which gives them a net equity position. Let's say it might be a billion, so you start a new bank in the UK, you might start with, a, say, 10 billion pounds of equity. Well, that 10 billion pounds of equity lets you get a leverage ratio that might let you create, say, 100 billion pounds worth of debt out of that and have 100 billion pounds worth of liabilities because that's the money creation process. And you then have a 10 million pound um, level equity supporting 100 million billion pounds worth of money creation. Okay, that's the leverage, and what banks will do is extend, expand that leverage during a boom and contract it during a slump, which is pro-cyclical, which actually causes the booms and the slumps. So that's that's the main thing. The banks can expand their equity if they didn't have the capacity to issue loans and didn't have the capacity to record deposits either. They wouldn't create money. This point is illustrated as well by at the moment you see a lot of still. big tech companies that have huge cash reserves and also uh, markets are willing to lend them at very low rates are using this same mechanism um, in order to basically buy up bonds of other high yielding bonds of different corporations, effectively bought lending using the fact that the market will lend them at low rates and buying up high yielding bonds to basically allocate capital. Um, so yeah, this. this idea that there's reserves and banks end up reserves rather than an equity is clearly absurd and yeah. Okay. One more question in the back. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, ask what you guys think about the um, sort of obsession that um, international finance institutions and national governments have with controlling inflation to two or three percent. And one part of your book, which I really enjoyed, was um, when you were saying we could actually inflate our way out of the lots of debts that we have. Um, obviously, I'd also like to know what you think would have to be the controls in place to make sure that this doesn't have a negative impact on, on the average Joe, you know, could, could help to resolve some yeah. problems of all these um, based assets. And you want to go with that one? Or do you sure, I mean, I have a particular view about the, the inflation uh, mandate of central banks. Um, and uh, it's not a coincidence that a large part of the kind of economic policy agenda that we've seen over the last 30 years has been central bank independence with um, uh, an in inflation um, target, uh, a mandate for inflation targeting. Um, and that's largely, I mean, it, it's kind of the, the inflation, the obsession with inflation is derived from the, the uh, phenomenon I was talking about earlier, whereby you have this crisis in the 1970s, you have a standoff between labour and capital, there's an attempt to kind of drive up wages in order to meet uh, inflationary pressures, which is then resolved by the bubble shock and the war on inflation that happens over the course of the 80s. Um, and that not only has the impact of dramatically um, kind of uh, reducing the power of labour combined with the, the war in the unions um, and leads to this decoupling between wages and productivity. It also, I, I, as I think you were alluding to, um, sucks tons of capital out of um, the global south. So there's been a massive increase in lending to uh, South Africa um, and kind of Latin America, various different parts of the world. Um, because of very low interest rates, uh, and often negative real interest rates in the 1960s and 70s. Um, that capital then gets, you know, it, it goes into um, the global south, and when the interest rate hike happens, it all suddenly gets sucked, sucked back uh, into, into America. Um, and that is again facilitated by a lot of the kind of policy decisions that I was alluding to earlier about, um, you know, the removal of capital controls, uh, these things that, that international financial institutions really pressure governments to reduce and, and remove capital controls, and that goes hand in hand with the kind of inflation targeting mandate. And so I'd argue that our obsession with inflation is a result of, well, rather than a kind of, it, a lot of people would argue that that's, you know, a, a result of changing kind of paradigm within economics, right? That people suddenly realise that, um, that start, start thinking about money in new ways, so kind of monetarism, and that infects our policy making decisions. I would argue that it's a function of the changing power in our economy whereby um, basically finance and asset holders start getting control over what we do and for them targeting inflation is, is very important because that has the potential to erode the value of their assets. Mm. So if we're going to have protections in place, if, if we could like, <coughs> move away from this paradigm and say actually we could allow inflation to be a little bit higher than 2-3% than um, one solution that rises capital controls would another be like wage, uh, sorry, inflation linked wages? Um, so yeah, that, that could be put out there as policies that would protect, protect the people, but kind of like rebalance the, the balance of like debts and assets in the economy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I would start from the, the premise that um, actually what matters just as much as policy is is power. So rather than saying we will have a policy where we're <coughs> wages with inflation, just say mandatory collective bargaining, you know, re-empower unions, um, start thinking about uh, well, I mean capital controls also have, have a simple a form of capital controls would have a similar effect in the sense that they would reduce a lot of people say that the reason that um, multinationals can basically arbitrage in terms of tax is because capital is mobile and labour is not. That's not an ironclad law, that's a, a policy choice. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things we can do and it's just as much about changing uh, power in the economy as it is about, about economic policy. Well, I'm a complete cynic on the possibility of doing that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my perspective is that we could do what I call a modern debt jubilee, which would be to use the central bank's money creation capability to cancel private debt. Mm -hmm. And since QE has made things so unequal, QE has basically inflated the price of assets, which is great if you own some, but useless if you don't. Uh, there's a justification, so let's go for a people's QE, where the government creates money for everybody on a per capita basis, and then those who've got debt, the debt has to be reduced, so the bankers of, central bank is effectively buying private debt off the private banks and then cancelling it. But when people who don't have debt get cash, then they'd be required to buy shares, which would be corporate shares that are used to cancel corporate debt. 
and therefore what you get is both an increase in the equity to debt ratio, dropping the amount of debt, increasing the amount of equity, and democratising share ownership because people who haven't had shares would suddenly get them. And it's very hard for the people who supported normal QE to say that's a bad thing because well, why is it a good thing that you've made the wealthy of the world so much wealthier out of your QE? Let's, let's you know, counter out what problem you admit occurred by democratising share ownership, which would go down like a lead balloon. Uh, so my more likely expectation is we're going to find ourselves doing it all the same way we did back in the Second World War, fighting an existential threat. <laughs> Only this time it won't be the Germans, it'll be climate change. Yeah. Well, that's an excellent one.